Welcome, folks. We're going to get underway in just a minute or so. Glad you could be with us. See some familiar faces and some familiar names. All right. Welcome, welcome um, to our uh, community gathering. We're going to have some, uh, learn a little bit about RJC history, hear about some of the projects that are underway, some of the ways to get involved and volunteer. Uh, all that's starting in a couple minutes, but we'll just give people a few more minutes to, you know, navigate the Zoom the Zoom thing of a jiggy, but thank you all for being here on time. I'm uh, David Greenson. I uh, use he/him pronouns, and I am the white accomplice organizer for RJC. And actually, we'll be doing introductions of our team later on too. So, but for now, uh, thank you for being here. And um, yeah, we'll give it another minute or so. All right, it's getting to that point when you can't fit everybody on the screen anymore. Oh, yep, there it comes. One page of two. That's always a good sign. I mean, not that you, the fact that you can't see people, that's not, that's kind of unfortunate, but I just mean that a lot of people are coming. So um, thank you for being here. We're just going to, we're going to start, let's, let's start at 503. Is that all right with you, Ayatunde? All right, you're, you're muted, just so you know, not that you don't. You need to be unmuted at the moment, but just so when your moment comes. Okay. All right. Okay. Welcome, welcome. Apologies to people who've heard me say more or less the same thing two or three times now because they made the mistake of being on time, but we're just giving everybody a minute or so to get on, and then we're going to have our call, and uh, I still want to call it a call, even though I guess technically this is not a call, really. This is a, a Zoom, I don't know, but anyway. Um, all right, all right, Tony, why don't you take it away when you're ready to, we're going to do a little bit of like uh uh, we're going to break out into groups of two or three to just have a little check-in question, just to kind of get our energy up for the for the for the for the call for the Zoom for the whatever this is. All right, Ayatunde, you're on. Um, okay, so the check-in question is: What? When was there a time in your life that you? felt or experienced something so beautiful that it was hard to put into words. So David, are you gonna break them out into breakout rooms or is, how are we gonna do that? I'm muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, I think I think so. So it, it's uh, groups of of two or three. Why don't you go ahead and repeat that question one more time? I attend. And if someone wants to put it in the chat, that's always a good thing because then people have it handy. When has there been a time in your life where you heard or felt something so beautiful it was hard to put into words? Mm. All right. We're going to uh, be in these uh, rooms for about six minutes. So a couple minutes for each person to share if you're in a group of three. So um, that's what we're going to do. Uh, and then you'll have about 30 seconds of, of warning before it ends. So here we go.
Hey, David. Hey, Steve. <laughs> let me let me put you in a room here. Here we go. Uh, hey, Crystal, how you doing? I'm gonna put you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm I doing can hear great. You. Hey. Um, I did not know this was gonna be like a breakout thing. I'm like super in motion. That's totally <laughs> That's okay. fine. It's all right. Uh, I'm going to put you and, and Marianne in a room together, and and the uh, the question is, um, when in your life have you have you had a? Um, it should be in the chat. Let's see. When was there a time in your life that you felt or experienced something so beautiful it was hard to put into words? Okay. All right. I'm going to Marianne. Are you there too? You're muted. I don't know if you. Uh... Here. Okay. I'm going to put you all together, and uh, you'll be there in just a minute. Hey, Diana, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Good to see you. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm um, in the car right now, which is why I'm off camera. No problem. We're just, uh, we did a little icebreakery kind of breakout thing, which is why it's just me right now. <laughs> Everybody's in a room uh, answering the question of um, when in your life, when was there a time in your life that you felt or experienced something so beautiful that it was hard to put into words? That's a so. great question. Yeah, I, I heard it um, oh. as I was walking out of the office and then gotcha. someone stopped me to <laughs> ask a question. Yeah. And so I got off the call and I'm just- um, Just jumping back just, on. Yeah, just jumping back on. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I felt like when I was, um, I was about 19 or 20, I um, had the opportunity to go down the Grand Canyon, down the Colorado River, like right through the the, the canyon, you know, from the bottom. And uh, there were there were some moments there that were just hard to capture and where it was just so beautiful, you know, the sky and the canyon and the, it's just, yeah, that's the first thing that comes to mind for me. Anything come to mind for you? An experience or a situation that was so beautiful it was hard to capture in words? And if you're needing to deal with driving stuff, <laughs> don't worry about uh, answering the question. Oh, now you're gone. Okay.
I am so sorry. I, I lost you. You were saying, um, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I, my audio dropped. It's for okay. A second. It's um, okay. It's you were saying okay. Grand Canyon. Yeah, I, I was, a, that was a pretty powerful experience. Hi, Eleanor. We're just actually five seconds away from ending this little opening breakout of, uh, of a check-in question. So, um, yeah. Um, and then people will be filing back in within 30 seconds. So good to see you both, um, or at least, well, see your picture, hear your voice, Diana, and good to see you, Eleanor. And oh, here comes other people. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and sorry about the technical difficulties. Ah, don't worry about it. it, it I, I get it. It happens. So. Hi, Alice. Hello. Oh, hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. Good to see you. It is been a while yeah it has been you guys have switched from 10 o'clock to four o'clock four four thirty on four. thursdays yeah Damn. that's right around this yeah that's right around this time it's not great for me it's not yeah i know i'm not sure how well it's we may have to look but um i'll send you a message about some other options we're looking at okay Hey, Eleanor. This is Bernie. I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm for a moment here, I'm just going to spotlight the different members of the RJC team that are here. Okay. Uh, that's why then, that's why you're seeing all of our faces be bigger than everybody else's just for the moment here. I think I've got everybody except for maybe Mike. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I just wanted to quickly go around the horn alphabetical style and just uh, say your name, your pronouns. Uh, what you do at RJC, just for all these fine people. And some of some of us people have seen before because because we're we're old timers, but some of us are newer. So, yeah. So why don't we do that, Adelaide? If you don't mind going first, that'd be awesome. All right. Hey everyone. Uh, I got to meet some of you. I look forward to meeting more of you. Uh, my name is Adelaide Dorfield, and I am the grants manager for RJC. So I've been working with uh, the organization for about a month, uh, really enjoying it. So thank you. You'll probably have to call on people, David. Oh, is the alphabetical. Is the alphabetical. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Ayotunde Dixon. I am a canvasser slash or events organizer. And I've been with RJC um, almost seven months now. Cool, cool. Uh, I'm next in the alphabet, David Greenson. Uh, he, him, pronouns, white accomplice organizer. I'll pass it to you, Mr. <laughs> Lewis. Greetings, everyone. It's Derek Lewis. I've been with the RJC for a little bit over a year as a business and IT consultant and loving the experience quite a bit. Hello. Uh, oh, sorry, David. No, no, good, good. No, you were, you were, you beat me to it. That's perfect. Yes. Um, my name is Aaron Barksdale. I've worked with RJC for since January of 2022. Um, and I am in outreach and engagement, and my pronouns are she, her. Hey, y'all. I am Mike Holmes. Uh, pronouns are they, them. I've been with RJC since about middle of May uh, 2022, and I am the canvassing director. Rob? I thought I might have been next. Um, oh, I, yeah. You're my right. name is uh, Rob Thomas, and still trying to figure out what my title is. Uh, I just do whatever it is that I can with with these wonderful people. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sparrow. I use they, them pronouns, and I do communications and storytelling here at RJC. I'm glad you're all here. Excited to meet y'all. All right. Well, I'm going to take away all the spotlights except the one on Mr. Rob Thomas, because next up, we're going to hear a little bit about some of the history of RJC, because people have been asking about that and realize that some folks have, have known about RJC for many years and some more recently. So we thought it'd be good to hear from Rob, who, who's a good storyteller. Like, how did all this happen? What's the, what's the background? So we're going to do that next, and then we'll move from that into sort of some more recent like updates on what's going on. All right. <clears throat> So I guess I'll get started on how the organization was kind of uh, unofficially formed. Uh, back in about around 2014, a situation that happened in Ferguson with Michael Brown and leaders, organizational leaders here in Asheville, uh, such as uh, James Edward Lee and uh, Beth Maxa and Carmen Ramos Kennedy and, and several others, including uh, coming to the table. I see we have Phoebe in the audience. They were one of the original organizations. They had leaders that came together, you know, kind of behind the scenes and were like, hey, we don't want something like this to happen in Asheville. So they proactively looked into solutions, uh, trying to prevent some a similar situation from happening in Asheville. <clears throat> some of the solutions that they looked into getting implemented were things such as um, de-escalation training for police, uh, you know, implicit bias training and explicit bias training for law enforcement and also pushing to get uh, written consent passed, uh, not only for people in vehicles, for, but for, for pedestrians as well. Um, they were successful in getting uh, almost all the things that they were looking to get implemented. implemented. Uh, you know, <clears throat> back in, I want to say about around, first, they, there was an incident in, in uh, Deaverview where an uh, individual by the name of Jerry J. Williams was... Uh, you know, killed by law enforcement inside of the housing development. From my understanding, uh, you know, this individual kind of went on a high speed chase and he got out of his vehicle in an unthreatening manner without any weapon and um, was shot so many times that uh, uh, one or a few of his limbs were uh, dislocated, like detached from his body. And it's, you know, the nature of policing with having to mark off the crime scene for forensics and do all collect evidence and all these things, you know, the body was kind of exposed to the community for uh, an extended duration. Um, that was a loud, loud outcry from community. Um, and, you know, protests happened and they were able to use this situation to be able to get uh, de-escalation training implemented, although they had been advocating for de-escalation training for, you know, year, multiple years before that, uh, this usually takes a crisis situation for solutions to actually start getting implemented. Um, then after that, uh, you know, after getting de-escalation training and implicit bias training implemented, we had the situation with uh, Mr. Johnny Rush back in 2018, where you had a black man who was jaywalking and was brutally beaten by a law enforcement officer. He was, you know, watching the video, he was <laughs> chased, beat, choked out, tased um, until he was unconscious and, you know, received a, a, a lot of verbal abuse as well. Um, <clears throat> that caused, again, the spotlight to be placed on policing and um, a little bit more momentum to uh, look for more drastic solutions to law enforcement. Um, then, you know, with the successes they had, like I said, with implicit uh, bias training, with de-escalation training, um, they were able to write a grant to Z. Smith Reynolds, which allowed them to then be able to hire me and bring me in because they were um, pretty much individuals that represented different nonprofits and they kind of needed somebody to, to hold the work, whereas they all had full-time jobs inside of their respective nonprofits. So I was brought in to, um, you know, satisfy the, the various deliverables in the grant, things such as, uh, you know, create an open data portal for policing or, you know, push to get that created, which law enforcement has created that. 
um, and also create a website for the RJC and a few other deliverables. And I was brought in in November 14, 2019 was when I started working with this organization. Um, so whenever I came in, a lot of things happened. You know, I came in and I'd say my first 90 days was kind of getting used to the environment. Uh, I appreciated the opportunity for the job because it was a very different. You know, I had never uh, worked inside of a quote unquote um, the nonprofit industrial complex, so to speak. And with me having a criminal background, uh, whenever I first looked at the job, I didn't think that I would even be able to get it. A few people inspired me and gave me confidence to then apply for the job. You know, inside of the the application itself, it also said previous justice involvement is not a disqualifier, which allowed me to have hope. Went through three interviews, got the job, and was very excited to come in. You know, three, four months after I came in, the pandemic hits in 2020. So it's about, you know, March. Um, so everything changed drastically. Like I said, I was just getting used to the environment, uh, the atmosphere of of working inside uh, nonprofits in Asheville and, and, you know, building a network, so to speak, and trying to get, uh, get momentum around some of the things that I was looking to do in this role. The pandemic comes and changes everything. I had to learn how to organize completely differently. You know, I was working in an office and um, all of my meetings were in person. So it caused me to have to learn how to organize and meet with people virtually, which was actually a good thing for me. I, I kind of like <laughs> being virtual and, and inside my home alone. I don't know. I'm an introverted extrovert. So things work out. Then we have uh, the whole Michael Brown. I mean, not Michael Brown. Sorry about that. George Floyd situation, uh, May 25th on my birthday. And that's when that's when us organizers and activists saw a really crucial time where we could use momentum to influence systems in a massive and drastic way just by looking around the nation and at what others were doing and how they were able to use the uh, I would say how how it was so obvious and in front of the public's face like. Honestly, those types of things are extremely normal to me. Um, people being killed by law enforcement, people, uh, you know, if you run, they're going to beat you. Like, that's an unwritten rule. But all these things were kind of coming out in the open and shocking people and people want to change. So, you know, we strategically came together and that's when uh, Black Asheville Demands was created. Started working with them and uh, combining our forces to kind of get some, some popular education out in the community. And we were able to have several uh, successes, um, reparations, reimagining public safety, uh, moratorium on urban renewal land. They considered renaming streets uh, that were named after slave owners, um, the Vance Monument being taken down, and several other things that have kind of sprung out of that. Um, racism being declared a, a public health crisis and several several other things that I say were ripple effects uh, of the massive amount of movement that uh, 2020 was. Um, after that, well, first I got to, you know, definitely send out some thanks to, to Tasia Etheridge or better known as Grits, who isn't here. Uh, I met them during the protests and was able to bring them in with some extra funding from Z Smith Reynolds. Um, before that, I, we, we didn't really have a budget. The budget was pretty much my salary. And they, Z Smith Reynolds, had put out extra funding, uh, you know, for things that were focused on reimagining public safety and law enforcement in general. And I was able to obtain that funding and be able to bring in Tasia Etheridge, who played probably one of the most pivotal roles in keeping up the momentum of the protests going on uh, in downtown Asheville. Uh, you know, I, I'm definitely super thankful to have met them at the protests and during the protests and to have been able to collaborate with them on a much deeper level as far as strategy and uh, content creation and, and many different ways. <clears throat> the YWCA then brought in uh, Trey Williams, who I've been honored to work with, with him as well. Um, and so it was me, Grits, Trey, and David. I guess I kind of left out the part where I <laughs> actually met David uh, way back in, in April of that year, where I was conducting a, a workshop on restorative justice and it was a really good learning experience for me. That was my first 
uh, first engagement that I ever facilitated, and I learned a lot. Um, I definitely learned what a container is and how you actually facilitate something that is an extremely controversial and touchy subject. Uh, I was given a lot of great feedback that was, you know, that I've definitely used thereafter. But anyway, went out to lunch with David and he's like, hey, what you got going on? And I'm like, man, it's just, it's just me. I got a whole lot of stuff going on trying to figure it out. And then we started working together daily. Um, I'd say he's probably working with me it, probably every bit of 50, 60 hours a week for a while. It was me, him, then it was me, him, and Grits. And then, um, like I said, uh, Savannah was working with me as well, Savannah Gibson. Um, and the pandemic hit, and Savannah had, had uh, you know, took other avenues and and seeked other employment because of the nature of the pandemic, uh, you know, it causes individuals to rethink a uh, situation and, you know, really contemplate life. And then they brought in Trey after that, and it was me, uh, Grits, David, and Trey. And then we slowly started to build. You know, we built the advocacy team, which is probably the lifeblood of our organization, whereas our niche is truly advocacy. Um, so what we do, well, what we look to do is empower the community with uh, information so they can have informed opinions about decisions that usually affect the most disenfranchised demographics of our city and our county and to be able to influence change because with the information um you pretty much know what can and can't be done uh, so if an individual says this can't be done and you know you've read information that pretty much shows otherwise that then gives you the option to be able to use your voice to um to influence individuals who are in decision making positions and so we were able to expand the advocacy team we started out like 45 people in the summer of 2020, where the pandemic had hit, the city was looking to basically, you know, spend $400,000 on food security. Um, whereas, uh, I want to say, there was a lot of data on, you know, rental assistance being a, a serious issue that was that was guaranteed to come up. And, you know, they were kind of beating around the bush and <clears throat> acting as if they didn't know uh, who was over it or they didn't act like acted as if they didn't have any information on it. And so this is the first time we mobilized the advocacy team, which was probably like 45 community members at that point. And, you know, three weeks later, it was a few hundred people and by just by people calling and asking about the money and where it was going to that caused them to change and start looking into what it would actually take to appease rental assistance and not just throw all the money into um, food security. So a lot of times just letting them know that you all actually know what's going on uh, creates a, a, a change in influence because um, that then caused them to shift gears and they ended up throwing about $200,000 towards rental assistance uh, for individuals that were kind of in a rental assistance uh, crisis. Um, the One Buncombe Fund was created shortly after that as well on the commissioner side of things. Um, but just, you know, this is this is our biggest tool is our advocacy, our voices and we're also um, we're able to get a lot done by utilizing that. So after we get these successes, uh, you know, with the resolution, moratorium, all these things, we knew that that was the easy part. We knew that 2020 was the moment where everything would actually be easy, although it was definitely hard work, protest. It was, you know, researching. It was meeting with the decision makers to try to negotiate some compromises sometimes and just completely frustrating at other times. But we knew that that was going to be the other part. So then, you know, after we got all these things initiated, we then had to, you know, kind of pivot our efforts, like such as the Reimagining Public Safety Initiative. That was the first thing that really put a spotlight on what we needed to do because the city held these listening sessions. And, you know, the whole Reimagining Public Safety was based off of you know, uh, people of color, black people uh, experiencing disparities and, um, you know, pretty much police sanctioned violence uh, through the way public safety was currently set up. And, you know, they held these listening sessions where at one point they had probably heard from over 1100 people and only <clears throat> 85 of those people were black, you know, for an initiative that's supposed to be based off the perspectives of the people who have been harmed by the initiative 
And for you to be okay with, you know, they only represented a very small percentage of the overall input that was received, uh, that that caused an, a large alarm for us. So then we created the Walk the Walk campaign to where we ourselves got out in community while, uh, you know, adhering to social distancing guidelines. We got out there with, cam uh, with voice recorders so that nobody had to write, so that we could social distance at a proper space. And we held conversations asking questions and also we're able to give them a $15 gift card because we did fundraising. Like our funding to do that came completely from the community. It came from businesses that were willing to do $5,000 matching donations. And it came from regular community members that donated to us as well. We didn't have grant funding to pay for this, but the community definitely put in a, a lot of funding to have it paid for. And so we got out there and we got all this feedback, which now we've put out our, um, you know, our results from the Walk the Walk campaign. Uh, I know that if you all are here, you all have definitely received the email and, uh, you know, have complete access to all the data from it. Uh, would definitely like to shout out uh, UNCA and Dr. Amina Batata and Dr. Tamari Macon to where they helped a lot with the codification and the theming of the data. And a lot of their students, uh, there's a lot of credits in the end of that Walk the Walk uh, survey data. They did an amazing job. Um, so we pivoted into that. And now, you know, with, with 2022, we're doing a similar pivot uh, pertaining to the reparations campaign. So our Every Black Voice Everywhere is kind of like I Walk the Walk campaign on steroids, which, you know, my coworker will be getting into that a little bit more. Um, but yeah, so we've, we've been down a long road. We had to take a pause as well to get a lot of the internal infrastructure working. As you, you all probably remember, a lot of you all have been with us throughout the duration um, of the RJC and our work. Uh, we used to do community calls monthly, and we had to take a pause to get some of our internal infrastructure created, uh, bring in new people, onboarding, create processes. Because, you know, whenever I first came into this organization, it was literally, you know, it was just me and support from the member organizations. Like, you know, there was no, there was no website, there was no uh, manual policy, uh, you know, procedures, protocol, all these things had to be created. We wasn't even incorporated as a uh, 501c3 um, yet. And so all of these things had to be done. Then we had to learn how to work with each other. So we bring on all these people and the first 90 to 100 days of it was completely relational. Like it's getting to know each other and getting to understand, you know, how we all think so that we can value each, each other's gifts. Because one thing that we primarily focus on, not only outside of our organization, but inside of it, is uh, anti-racist, uh, you know, non-white supremacy uh, culture um, inside of our organization. There's a lot of pieces to that. There's a lot of isms. You have ableism, sexism, racism. Uh, I could just go down a list about 20 to 30 isms that we have to be very vigilant about inside our actual structure. And, you know, us as human beings, sometimes we want to revert back to normal systems of how you do things, but a lot of times it's better to put in the work and identify the new ways to do them. And that's what we've been doing for the most part, um, you know, for, the, like I said, the first, I would say the first quarter of this year. And now we have our capacity back. We have our inter, uh, you know, Staff, inter staff uh, relationships have been built and we've been doing some great things already. Um, I definitely appreciate working with all my coworkers that are on this call and the ones that are not on this call because there's a lot of them, uh, there's a few others that, that work very closely with us that, um, that are not on this call. But yeah, doing all that work, extremely complicated. So the inside work, the outside work while trying to figure out organizational sustainability, while holding the city accountable to the wins that we've already gotten, such as reparations, such as reimagining public safety, such as, you know, the tax appraisal system and the inequities within it, and, you know, 10, 15 other things. It came to one point where we had to actually analyze what we were putting our energy into so that we could figure out what we should prioritize because we had our hands in too many buckets and too many pots. And, you know, you divide your energy up and each everything gets a less amount of energy. And I think now we're on a really good track. And I want to say that's probably about my time. I, I will hand it back to the host to pass it to the next individual. If there's anything I missed, I think I'll be uh, in a break. Breakouts later will be uh, if people have questions, you know, or would like more information from Rob, 
uh, you can go into a breakout and ask them whatever you want. Um, but uh, but now, yeah, we do want to pivot uh, for a few minutes and just get some uh, some updates. Rob referenced a few of these things. Uh, what, the first one, the Every Black Voice campaign. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take the spotlight off of Rob and put it on to Aaron. But now, now I don't see Aaron anymore, so I have to. Uh, all right, well, Aaron, you can start talking. And I'll spotlight you as soon as I find you. <laughs> Sure. Thanks, David. Um, so as Rob mentioned, the Every Black Voice campaign is kind of like a larger scale walk the walk, um, but we have a different purpose. Um, so we're focused on reparations and we're interviewing Black community members around what they want to see from the reparations process currently underway in Asheville City and Buncombe County. So um, we ask questions about reimagining uh, relationship with law enforcement. Um, do they feel like Asheville is a place where they can financially thrive? Um, things like that. And we're going to be making a report with the data that we find um, and provide that to the Reparations Commission to ultimately try to influence the recommendations that they make to the city and the county. Um, and this uh, entire campaign is truly grounded in the belief that we need to go directly to community, especially for something uh, like reparations that's supposed to be benefiting the Black community. Um, so, yeah, is there anything else you would like me to include, David? I feel like I always talk so fast on these calls because I get nervous. <laughs> well, um, I, I will try to be brief with my report. Maybe Mr. Lewis can too, and then we can we will probably have a little time if anybody has any questions. Um, but I, the project that I've been working on uh, since last November, so uh, we, we're coming up on the anniversary, um, uh, is the Government Accountability Project, or GAP, um, which is um, essentially our, our weekly newsletter about what's happening in, in Buncombe County, at the county, county government, city government. Um, we have volunteers, and we'll be talking more about that later that uh, go to, to different committee meetings and report out what's happening. We have uh, folks that are building relationships with people inside government. We have a team that looks at, at both the city and the county uh, agendas when they um, get posted so that we can, um, we can jump in with, with, uh, with advocacy around uh, what's coming up on those agendas. Um, we have a strategy team made up of um, former city council member Keith Young, uh, Reverend Tammy Forte Logan, uh, Tiffany Debelo, three really important Black community leaders, and they meet weekly to to mull through all these different things and decide like what what are the most important issues for people to pay attention to this week, um, and we we uh, we get some results. You know, uh, we 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 notice uh, when when you watch the actual meetings that sometimes they're they're responding to some of the things that we've said, and we've gotten some email responses back. I just saw uh, Avril Pinder, the county manager. We asked last week whether the county has a uh, a policy of of prioritizing um, POC businesses when they do when they look for contracts, and she sent a whole detailed thing about what they do and so on. So. Um, we, we get their attention and we, and we make sure that they know that we're, we're paying attention and um, that really makes a difference. Mr. Lewis, I'm going to go ahead and um, turn it over to you if, if you like it, because you want to, if you don't mind telling a little bit about some of the supporting organizations that have come aboard or just giving an update on all that. So in reference to this, we have basically refreshed our memorandum of understanding so that we could come into this new space of 2022 relevant to what we are doing. So the people who have been participating as coalition supporters for, for years, for a couple of years at least, were asked to refresh and, and sign the agreement. And as a result, we've got people that have been added as well. Uh, we are now seeking to make sure that all of the people who have been participating um, update and sign and, and that recognize the new changes and how we operate. We're really excited about the, those who have already refreshed and are pursuing the others. And as far as how we are reaching out to the community, we are looking at bringing more Black-led organizations into this coalition. Um, to be more relevant to the community. And like Rob said earlier, you know, we find that a lot of times 
we have more white body people, white bodied organizations engaging in this conversation and we really want to change that dynamic. So we've been focusing on how we can recruit and enable those participants as well so we can have that better resiliency, the diversity that we really need to connect with what's going on in the community. So if you're, if you're on this call and you're interested in, in maybe participating to the level of being a supporter, um, I'll be glad to send you an invitation. It's a form you fill out. You can read the MOU to, to grasp what it is that we're asking of the supporters. And basically, just reach out to me and I'll make sure you can get signed up and be part of this, this movement. It's actually a movement. Dave, you had any more questions I can address? But that's no, that's 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 great for for right now, Mr. Lewis. Um, we're gonna uh, what I'm gonna suggest we do next is um, there's just sort of one more section before we are gonna go to the small groups portion, uh, and and I think we'll have a little space for some questions in between. So that's what I'm gonna go for. So um, right now we wanted to just give you a, you all an idea of some of the ways to get involved more with RJC. Uh, many of you are already involved in various ways, but if you're curious about some of the volunteer opportunities that exist, uh, well, today's your lucky day. So I'm gonna ask um, Jody and Rachel and Sparrow talk a little bit about what, what's up with the communications team. Um, let me go ahead and spotlight you all. There's Sparrow. So tell, tell folks what, why it's this, why the comms team is like the place to be. Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> comms team is the place to be. Um, it's, well, I'll say this one, we really do um, try to build relationships and not just like blindsidedly work alongside each other. Um, and I really appreciate being able to be in community with with the comms folk and especially Jody and Rachel since y'all are here. Um, shout out to y'all. Um, but yeah, com communications is a lot of emails, a lot of proofreading, editing. Um, communications also is like, there's an option to be um, engaged with our social media, um, with our newsletter. Um, and it's like a lot of detail oriented activity, a lot of like logistics of like um, link checking or um, yeah, just like reviewing and and then passing it on to someone else who does the same thing. And um, yeah, but it, I enjoy it. The team's great. And yeah, that's all I've got to say about comps. <laughs> Um, I, I feel like there's so little to add, Sarah, you covered pretty much everything. Um, I just want to say that, uh, communications, the communications team is like that avenue by which the advocacy that Rob was talking about related to educating the community so that the community can advocate, um, communications is where that goes. And so, um, it comes through, um, and, uh, our job is to make sure that it's clear and that it um, is consistent with our um, mission and values um, and uh, is a really great opportunity to be involved and to know what's happening um, on the front end, which is, is a huge benefit. So there's the emails, the social media and the newsletter, which Rachel, would you say a little bit about the newsletter? Sure, um, yeah. I definitely co-sign everything Sparrow and Jody have said. Uh, we just launched a, a monthly newsletter, so um, which is really exciting. There's more space there. We're thinking of it as sort of a source of truth and play. And um, so it's, there are a lot of calls to action, you know, sort of the more, um, more timely opportunities for commu communications team members to jump in and help um, just get those communications out the door and out to the community. Uh, and the newsletter is sort of an opportunity to, um, to do some more storytelling and 
you know, lift back up uh, things that feel um, especially important and relevant that we want to shine a little bit of a brighter light on. Um, so from a comms team member perspective, I think there are a few ways to get involved, Some definitely some creative um, writing, um, and then more of the proofreading, editing, that really important um, kind of final piece before things sort of head out the door. So um, it's kind of a really nice mix, and it's a really amazing team of people that it's the most fun signal group I could ever imagine being a part of. Um, it's it's incredible. So. Yeah, the comms team, the comms team does have a pretty good time. I, I will add just, you know, if, if you, so yes, if you're a creative person who likes to write or you're a, you're like a, like a grammar nerd and you like to like pick apart whether, where apostrophe should go, then the comms team for you. But even if those aren't you, um, honestly, a lot of what's important in the comms team is just reading stuff and like being a person and being like, I don't really get this. And so, you know, like letting people know this doesn't really make sense. So you could just be somebody who reads and who leaves comments and says this, I, I'm not sure I get this, or this was really clear. Just giving that kind of feedback is really useful because we're all sort of standing in for the eventual readers. To, so if you're a person who ever reads any of our emails, you can help us maintain, you know, hopefully some good quality there. So Thanks, comms team. I'm going to pivot now to uh, let Adelaia uh, take the spotlight to talk about the grants, the grant writing team. Hey, everyone. Uh, again, Adelaia, the new grants manager. And yeah, uh, we are kind of up to capacity um, with as far as reviewing grants. Um, so October, uh, my first month, uh, we wrote a total of five grants, or um, I wrote five grants with the uh, help of our um, uh, director of development, Bell. Um, and we just realized we needed a lot more support uh, with grant writing, people to review the grants, any suggestions, making sure we're answering the questions directly. Um, so we're really trying to build a volunteer team around that. So. Um, anyone who has grant writing experience or even people who just like to proofread. Um, and it's also a cool way just to learn about RGC and what we're doing um, as well. Um, Cause in that first month, I learned a lot about the organization writing those grants. Um, so yeah, it would be really nice just to get that support. Uh, again, proofreading, any suggestions, making sure we're answering those questions, grammar is on point. So yeah. Yay, yeah. Very cool. And this is a chance to be part of a team that's really like just in the beginning of forming. So you get to be like one of the pioneers in the grant writing team. So that could be fun. Um, I'm going to pivot it over to Aaron, I think, to talk about the research team. Hello, hello. So I know that it's not going to be as fun as comms, but... <laughs> Listen, we do need people to help us out with research. Um, as I was saying earlier about um, the whole purpose of Every Black Voice, it's going to be eventually to provide um, that data um, to the Reparations Commission as well as publish it so that we can put it out into the community. We also really value, you know, we're, we're getting this information from the community. We want to put it back out into the community as well. Um, one of the ways that we do that is by transcribing and coding um, the interviews. And that's basically so that we can take something that's um, very qualitative and try to make it quantitative um, in the best way possible without losing the true sentiment of um, what's being communicated. So it it's it can be a pretty, you know, um complicated process, but we um I don't know. I feel like we enjoy critically thinking about how we can best like get this information out um, that, uh, like I said, from from those interviews. So a lot of it's going to be uh, transcribing. And if you don't know what transcribing is, that's um, taking audio and then basically like writing it out um, physically. So putting it into a document. We do have um, software that we use. Uh, we're in the process of reevaluating the software potentially just to make it a little easier um, for our, and I need to shout out Mike here because when Mike first joined us, Mike was a community researcher and they 
transcribed majority of like, it was like 80 interviews, something wild. So um, Mike would of course be assisting with uh, research as well. And then the coding process is kind of putting all of uh, that uh, information into buckets. Um, so it's like saying, when we ask this question, how many people said, mentioned this topic? How many people mentioned this topic? And also like, what was the sentiment of it? Were they saying it in a positive way, in a negative way, in a neutral way? Um, so that's kind of the uh, overall gist of the uh, research team. Yay, yay, research, super fun. And I don't know, I think you all can be just as exciting and lively. The comms team wasn't always, you know, it had to be built up. So I think you can give them a run for their money. Um, I wanted to um, to bring forward a few of my my colleagues working on the um, on the GAP team. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, just just pull into the spotlight. I hope they don't mind. Uh, Eleanor and Joe. And I'll bring myself in here too. And um, yeah, we, we work in different aspects of the uh, of the GAP project. And um, maybe we'll start with how do you feel, Joe, about telling us what, what, what do the committee watchers do? And why is that a fun job? Sure. Well, I, I, we need to talk about letting comms go first because now I feel like I'm scrambling to keep up. I with know I'm regretting that. Energy, which yeah. is a losing battle for sure. But um, yeah, let's see. Um, so we, uh, as part of the government accountability project, we enlist a number of volunteers. Eleanor is one, and Jerry out there in the audience is one, and Marianne and some others. Um, we uh, sit in on various. Uh, city and county committees and listen in for policy content that has um, implications for racial equity. And we try and suss that out, kind of try and separate that out from the kind of, as you can imagine, high volume of sort of ordinary bureaucratic proceedings and um, single out what, what we think is gonna um, matter most for Asheville's Black communities. And so <laughs> we, um, we listen closely, we exchange information with each other, and we try and funnel all of that toward the GAP strategy team that, that David mentioned earlier. So it's a great way to get involved, particularly if you're interested in, in local civics, if you're interested in policy, if you're interested in specific content areas like public safety, um, housing, uh, community development, economic development, education, those kinds of policy areas obviously are very, very important. And so if you wanna learn more about how the, <laughs> it's a disgusting analogy, but how the, sort of how the sausage is made at the local level, it's a great way to, great way to do that. And we've got an awesome team helping us, helping us do it each week. Yes, indeed. And it's, it's a really, it's a very, it's crucial work because it's it's in these small spaces and these you know in these moments that that so much important stuff happens and it's very much outside the spotlight so um, it's really important that we're paying attention so we can know what's going on. Um, Eleanor, you want to talk about what the Gap Relationship Building Team does? Sure, we are very very new. I think we've been going maybe a month or um, maybe not much more than that, and our focus is on developing relationships with both staff at the county and city, as well as with elected officials. So most of the energy right now is going towards staff. Um, and our ultimate goal will be to um, move them toward generating more support for reparations um, and in the equity area. And we're still learning about um, how to make that work, establishing relationships, staff are really busy. Um, and, but I, for me, it's really exciting because relationships are for me kind of um, what really builds um, working that we're all working in the same direction and really getting staff. I don't think staff get a lot of attention because it seems as if there's been a good response to people beginning meeting, but we've only had, I think most everyone has only had one meeting or one contact. Um, and so we're very much in learning mode. 
Um, but for all of you who really enjoy having one-on-one -on -one relationships um, and want to do something new, that's where we are. So it's exciting. Yay. Yes. Yay to relationships. Super important. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll bring up the rear here on the gap team, which is that the, uh, the third leg of our of our gap stool is the agenda analysis team. Um, and every week, pretty much uh, an agenda comes out for an upcoming meeting, either the city council's meeting the week after or county commission. And we go through the agenda and see like, what, what the heck are they going to be talking about? Um, hopefully, these things have come through some sort of committee. So we've had a little bit of a heads up from the team that, that Joe works with. Uh, maybe we know a few things because we've had some conversations through what Eleanor uh, Eleanor's group does. Uh, but in the end, uh, this is when you know it's about to it's about to happen. They're about to vote on something, and and so it's kind of the last the last line of defense. Uh, if something bad is going to happen or something good, you know, we 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 always want to uh, lift up if there's a, an opportunity to to step in to support something. Um, that's so we go through those agendas. Uh, try to to figure out you know what's what's relevant and all this information then goes to um, the uh, strategy team to kind of make sense of. Um, I want to add that um, all of the teams that that we presented to you all today, um, you know, we're, we're all setting aside time to to build relationship with each other as well. So we're having regular meetings where we can talk about what's coming up for us as we volunteer together, get to know each other a little better. Um, so that we can all uh, be as fun as the comms team. Um, that's the goal. And uh, yeah, we're coming for you comms. You know, actually I'm on the comms team too. <laughs> so I, should, I shouldn't I should be, but I, anyway, uh, <clears throat> we're all gonna be having a good time. Um, we have time for for a few questions because I, I realize we've been talking at you for a long time. There's just so much to cover. Um, and then we're gonna go into to breakout rooms. You get to choose which breakout room you wanna go to where you might wanna get more information. Um, and we'll probably just go into those breakout rooms and then people can just disperse from there. What We won't come back to the big room anymore. Um, but uh, if there are questions, uh, you can put them in the chat. You can unmute yourself. Um, we, we could certainly take a few if, if anything that we've covered, the history, some of the projects, the volunteer opportunities. You also can go into a breakout and ask questions of, of somebody because we're, we're all going to be in different rooms. But this is this is Mary Alm, and, I, and it is about the uh, government accountability group. I really yeah. appreciate those weekly messages, and I frequently write based on those messages. And I got a very interesting response from Mayor Mannheimer hmm. and had nowhere to send it, except that I happened to have Tiffany's personal email. So I sent it to Tiffany because I had her email, but there was no way for me that I could figure out from the website to contact y'all and say, I got this interesting response from Mayor Mannheimer. Oh. So Thank that would be. Thank you. Uh, that's a great flag. I, I, you can all, so info at gapavl.org is our email address. I, I did not realize we did not like feature that on the website for if you get things, please. Uh, it's the one that when you get the things from us, it's, you can always go back to any of those messages and hit reply and it will come back to us either uh, that way too. Okay. And yes, it yeah. should like, that would be much better to make it like really obvious how you can send something along. That'd be great. So thank you. Anybody else with a question or a comment? Uh, I see one from you, Rachel. Do you want to you want to give voice to that? Sure. Um, you know, we're still in a pandemic, um, but um, the comms team does do a great job of coming together on regular basis. Um, just wondered if there were opportunities um, that might be dreamt about or talked about um, to bring together the team and volunteers and just curious if there's anything happening around that conversationally. Situations where we, where like it might be like yeah, all hands on deck. Can you say more what you're what you're asking about? Uh, sure well, we've talked about that the different teams do a really good job of kind of building community and and building relationship to do this work together. Just didn't know if there were um, 
opportunities to do that. And as I'm saying that, if um, I realize nobody, me least of all, has a right to um, to point out something that's not happening and not like volunteer to do something about it. So oh. I'll, I'll do that as well. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. <laughs> it's okay to do that. No, I but, mean, well, this is kind of hopefully that, like we wanted to have these community yeah. gatherings so we can bring people together from doing different things and new people and so on. And we hope to do some of these in person too. So it can be more oh. like, you know, more like a party. And yeah, and there very well could be situations where it, we could, it could be a work project. It could be something we, you know, I, so I don't, there's nothing really, uh, on the horizon that I know of that's like sort of an all hands on deck kind of um, we need everybody to work on something but we're going to be doing some fundraising events which certainly the more the merrier to help support those both logistically and showing up um, things like that I see there's a question about the truth justice and reconciliation uh, campaign and I'm wondering Rob if you can speak a little bit to that because those those are we're going to be holding some events around the truth justice and reconciliation that would be great for everybody to attend Rob do you want to talk about truth, justice, and reconciliation? Uh, yes, sure. So it's one of our newer initiatives, although we've kind of, you know, I've, I've been working with a uh, beloved community and a few uh, community members behind the scenes for about a year, um, but we're getting ready to get into a big, a big push with it. Uh, we hold uh, weekly meetings, or bi-weekly right now, anyway, to organize it, and we're going to be bringing this in the community heavily. heavily. Uh, it's about I would say the theme is about uncovering some deeper truths. Whereas when you look at, you know, what's going on in America, uh, the separation of people by race, uh, religion, class, and creed, all these things were done strategically. And so we're trying to get to the truth of a lot of things to be able to bring together a people, um, you know, within our region, uh, Western North Carolina, and also collaborate throughout the state of, of North Carolina, actually through the beloved, uh, the beloved community of Greensboro with um, Reverend Nelson Johnson and his, and his wonderful wife, um, Joyce Johnson, who have been organizers for about three or four decades. They're definitely individuals that I greatly look up to and I appreciate their ideology. Um, you know, they brought me to Greensboro a couple weeks ago and I'm always amazed at how they see things and how they see the solution that's needed. You know, we're definitely in in a in a crisis mode. If we look at our political arena and we really truly look at what's going on uh, in America today, to where we could be in a serious crisis by 2024. And this initiative is actually one of the things that we're looking to do to help bring people together and create an area of peace um, outside of political ide ideologies and and the separation that's happened um, strategically ever since the John Punch uh, case. Um, which I won't go into that. It's a longer story. Um, but, you know, we've been systematically and strategically divided. And uh, yeah, this is this is one to bring out a whole lot of troops of what's happened to various communities and definitely with a spotlight on the black community to give black community members a uh, space to speak their truth and hopefully also create some momentum where we can get some changes um, that affect the black community primarily and predominantly, but also uh, other communities that have been disenfranchised. Like I said, it'll be all of Western North Carolina. So we have, you know, we have a lot of people that that are not a part of the status quo within within this entire region or people that would like to see a change for betterment to where we can actually get into some of the truth and justice so that we can actually move into reconciliation. You know, a lot of people just want to move straight to the reconciliation and are just like, why can't you just be okay with what happened? And, you know, it hasn't even technically been on the record of what happened. You know, history is still being uh, debated upon whether or not it should even be placed in school inside of a history book, which is crazy to me. But anyway, hopefully this initiative will, one, bring out a lot of truths to show people uh, that the division that we hold, uh, you know, with the with the illusion that race actually is, is something that we can dismantle and um, it'll hopefully inspire more collaboration between uh, social classes, races, um, you know, individuals of different belief systems, so forth and so forth to where we can get to, uh, you know, some of the most important truths, which will hopefully um, be identified in this process. Thanks, Rob. And 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 just uh, when do you think is going to be the, the first sort of public 
uh, offering where people, you know, anybody can come to, to participate. Is that coming up anytime soon? No, I would say, I want to say on the 10th is where we have a meeting where we're looking for organizers. So we're probably needing people with specific skill sets to help us organize this campaign in general. And then we'll hold a larger community member, a uh, larger community meeting okay. sometime shortly after that. So we're not that far along yet. We've still got to okay. bring in more people. So, so we'll, we'll definitely, you know, you, you'll get emails from us when, when that time is, is ripe for people to, to come out for, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and you just, you know, cause I, we, we had said 615, I want people to have a little bit of chance in the small groups. So these are, I'm going to open up the small groups in just a minute. And here are the choices you're going to have, and I'll just quickly run through them. So, um, the gap agenda analysis and relationship building will be with actually it should say Eleanor too. me and Eleanor will be in one room. So if you're interested in doing agenda analysis or building relationships, come and talk to us. We'll tell you all about it. Uh, obviously, you can only pick one, although you can jump around a little bit. I think the technology allows for that, but there's not a ton of time. So you can always follow up later. Uh, if there's things that if you have more than one interest, uh, then the gap committee watchers uh, with Joe uh, communications team. Uh, volunteering there. That would be Sparrow, Jody, and Rachel will be in that room. Adelaide will be talking to folks about volunteering as a grant writing. Aaron will be hosting folks wanting to talk about research. And then if you're already volunteering and you don't necessarily want to do more, or it's just not right for you right now, but you're, we're glad you're here anyway, we got two rooms where you can just talk to Rob more about history or pretty much anything, because Rob's got lots of opinions about lots of things, and they're all very interesting. Um, or if you want to know more about Every Black Voice, Mike's going to be in a room where you can talk more about that. That's our, really our big focus right now is that campaign. So um, if you're just curious about that, uh, you can go there, talk to Mike. If you're curious about history or, or, or whatever else, you can come talk to Rob. If you're interested in volunteering, you got these various choices to, to jump into. So, uh, and of course, if you want to just uh, go ahead and get on with your evening, you can you can check out as soon as we go into the breakouts, but I hope you won't. So we can chat a little bit more personally. Uh, I'm going to open up the rooms, and um, yeah, uh, it's going to be set for about 15 minutes, but that takes us past our 6:15 thing. So just stay as long as as you need to, at, or as, as you can, and then um, we'll just we'll just head out from those small groups uh, rather than coming back to the big group. So um, that's it. Thanks everybody for being here, and uh, yeah, go ahead and pick a small group to to join, um, and uh, here we go.